comedy helps for me, yeah. helps me get through traumatic things, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the payoff. Like if I was just an accountant and I had to deal with racism, get out of here. Like I'd be so annoyed. But at least now when something racist happens or something sexist happens or something just awful happens, it doesn't even have to be related to race or gender. Now I go, oh, hold on, you have like this outlet to make fun of this situation. Today we got with us none other than Hodo Hersi. Hodo is a comedian and a writer, and she made her late night television debut on Seth Meyers and even performed with an open for Hassan Minaj. She is an awesome comedian and currently is a writer on Amazon's untitled Rami Youssef's animated show. Hodo often speaks about being a black Muslim woman who wears the hijab and how she navigates the world as one. Hodo, thank you so much for being here with us today, knowing your journey in comedy. What inspired you to start? Um, what inspired me to start doing comedy was, um, people always told me that I was funny growing up, like I would make people laugh and that, that brought me joy. Uh, and then I realized like laughter is very disarming. So if someone's mad at you or sad, mm -hmm. making them laugh is like, like almost this magic trick, like you can switch the mood instantly and break tension. Um, but really it was, what really actively made me wanna get into comedy was watching the Chappelle show with my um, older brother, which I was probably too young to be watching some of that stuff. But I remember just watching the Chappelle show, loving it, and then like a light bulb went off and I was like, oh, this can be a career. Like people actually make people laugh for a living and you make money off of it. So I just said to myself, oh yeah, when I get older, this is what I'm gonna do. I love that. How old were you when you I was like that? early high school. Okay. Yeah, middle school. I think that's when the show came out. Yeah, yeah. And I'm aging myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wanna know what about that show inspired you? Like what was it about seeing Chappelle on stage? Fellow Muslim brother. I mean, he didn't became, he wasn't Muslim at this point, but <laughs> what was really cool about that was um, it was seeing someone take really heavy things like race, you know, talking about very traumatic things and making them funny. You know what I mean? And it was like this form of education, but it wasn't preachy. And mm -hmm. I loved that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, he's really changing people's minds without even realizing it. Well, maybe he does realize it, but yeah, I, I was like, oh, laughter really has a way of, it sounds so cheesy, but laughter has a way of like educating people. It really does, right? Yeah, yeah. and also like saying mm -hmm. what you want to say. Um, what is it? There's a Seinfeld quote where he says, uh, being f funny, something about how comedy is just like a funny way of being serious. So I love the fact that you said that comedy does have the power to actually like convince people and convey serious topics in a way that's digestible. I think that's the word, right? It's like people can actually digest it and understand. Yeah, I also think comedy helps for me, yeah. helps me get through traumatic things, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the payoff. Like if I was just an accountant and I had to deal with racism, get out of here. Like I'd be so annoyed. But at least now when something racist happens or something sexist happens or something just awful happens, it doesn't even have to be related to race or gender. Now I go, oh, hold on, you have like this outlet to make fun of this situation. You know what I mean? There's like, um, like a payoff. Someone says something awful and then Holdo says a joke and then makes money off of it. And then who wins in the end? I do. I love that. You know what I mean? So you kind of saw it as like, how do you work it to your advantage? Yeah. But I care about the world. I care about having a fair world, mm -hmm. but also I have a side of me that's like, it's, I love saying like I have capitalist piggy tendencies where I'm like, yeah, girl, I'm gonna make money off this. You think <laughs> you hurt my feelings? I'm taking it to the bank. I, <laughs> you know, so you talked a lot about how comedy inspires, uh, or sorry, how your experiences <laughs> inspire the comedy that you have. What would you say uh, was a moment when you were like, okay, 
I can take this and go on stage? Um, the high school that I went to was, it was called Richview, and I had this joke, um, which will be out on my album coming out sometime next year. But I had, um, I had this joke about the high school that I went to. It was very white, very like all the kids were middle, comfortably middle class, upper middle class, like they had money. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even say middle class. A lot of them were upper middle class and just like truly had money. Um, and it was very white. And I remember there was just so many like not so much outwardly racist things that happened, but there was a lot of subtle racism. It was just very clear that I was the other and I wasn't, you know, like no one wanted to have anything to do with me. And so many of those experiences were so horrible and damaging that I was like, oh, okay, yeah, like I'm going to turn this into something, you know? Um, so yeah, I think the high school being as horrible as it was, was for sure the thing that inspired me to be like, oh, I'm going to take all of this and talk about it. Was that when <clears throat> you also realized you were funny? Like, hey, I got this. Or did you always know you were funny? Individual? I knew I was like f funny, but I didn't know I was like as funny. So like with comedy, no one can. I heard some, this a comedian said this once. I forget his name. Marco something. But he said, no one can teach you to be funny, but you can learn to be funnier. So I had the seed of being funny, mm -hmm. but like, you know, it was, I didn't know how to like write jokes and, you know, get up on stage and like nurture the talent. But I knew the seed of me being funny was there. So I wouldn't say I was like, you know, because yeah. me now, it's like, girl, come on. She's so funny. But <laughs> me in high school, you know, yeah, obviously that. not. Yeah, I love that. Marco something said <clears throat> some wise words. I forget his name, but he was like a comedian that you, he used to do comedy and he stopped. Mm -hmm. Um, and I understand why people leave comedy because it's so stressful. Neil mm -hmm. Brennan said this really interesting thing years ago on a podcast. He said, and he's the co-creator of The Chappelle Show. And he said, um, comedy is one of those jobs where you will you don't know, every day you get up and you don't know if you'll be able to do your job. Because there's no formula on how to be funny. Well, there's no guarantee that I'll, you know, mm. get a, get an idea for a good joke again. There's none of that. It just pops into my mind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like a surgeon goes to school and learns how to be a surgeon. And there's like, there are rules and, you know, things to follow. But with comedy, yeah, there are some rules. But ultimately, the joke's got to come from you. And there's, where does that come from? You know? Mm -hmm. That's actually a very cool way of looking at it. Because there is no, like, blueprint <laughs> no. or, you know, a specific <clears throat> career path. And every path and every, especially in the creative industry, it looks different, right? Yeah, there's, yeah. And there's, uh, you know, different types of comedians, there are uh, writers, and you're doing both. And I'm curious. You got to do both, yeah. You got to <clears throat> do pan both. The pan, excuse me. Mm -hmm. The pandemic, I think, showed people that you got to do more than one thing because there was no stand-up. Mm. And that was how I was surviving was I was doing, I was writing for TV. Okay. Was that inspired by the pandemic or did no, you No, I knew it? I always wanted to write for television yeah. because I knew, like, no one's writing roles for me. So you no one's writing write... roles for someone who's black Muslim and wears a hijab. I love that. And you wanted to write, not the, th wait, I don't love that. I love the fact that you were taking that initiative and, yeah, yeah. and starting to write those roles for yourself and for people like you and who look like you and have those lived experiences. Yeah, I try to stay away from that because I think, um, like, I didn't get, it. it's nice when some people will come up to me and say, oh, this is, you know. I've had a couple of people say, oh, this is very inspiring. What you're doing is inspiring. I, I never got into comedy to be an inspiration because mm. I feel like then I'm putting myself on a pedestal and then I don't know if I'm going to meet people's expectations. It's nice that I'm an accidental inspiration for some people. That's beautiful. But like I would never. Yeah, I just it's too much pressure to go into this business and say I want to ins inspire people. I guess along the way I will. But. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like dealing with people's expectations is very scary, you know? And how do you deal with people's expectations? Because you're right, like you're there to make people laugh. But at the same time, you are a very inspiring figure and the power to be seen means people can see themselves. So how do you do that? How do I deal with the people's expectations? Um, <clears throat> um, you got to go to therapy. God bless therapy. You got to go to therapy, truly. I'm not even like, that's like... 
whenever people are like, oh, I really want to become a really good comedian, singer, dancer, anything in this business, I'm like, you got to make sure like up here is all good. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think therapy is really, really important. Um, and then another thing is just, um, RuPaul said this and I love it. And it was, his advice was find your tribe because no one ever does anything on their own. Like right now you, you have a team of people that are helping you execute this. Absolutely. Right? And so on with stand up, people just see me on stage, but then I have my close tight knit group of friends in comedy. I can count them on one hand. Um and then I have like my manager, you know, and you know, you'll have people that'll help you out. So you just you got to find good people. You got to mm. find your tribe. So I think that's really important. Uh, because, uh, and RuPaul also says this, you know, we all have like an inner saboteur. That voice in our head sometimes will turn on us and say crazy things. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes the call is coming from inside the house and you just need people are in your circle to remind you like, hey, come back down to earth. It's fine. You know, don't listen. You know what I mean? And so that's, yes, yeah, so I think that's surrounding yourself with good people is very important. Okay, so therapy 100% I agree with that. It's, yeah. Therapy helps you make sense of things. There's that support system that's always going to be there. And also you don't realize all the things you're carrying. Very good point. You don't even realize. Yeah, yeah. there was a lot of like anger, resentments mm. that I was carrying, sadness that I was carrying. And it was only through therapy that I was that I was able to like, it's almost like you're carrying a heavy box and you don't realize it. Mm. You finally get to put mm -hmm. it down and things are lighter. And that's the beautiful thing about therapy is that it makes you more aware. So you can be living your life having that resentment and not knowing that you had that resentment. Not even knowing, yeah. And then making sense of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and therapy is gold, yeah. Therapy is gold. So if anyone watching this uh, and you're in the creative sphere. You got to go to therapy. Got to go to therapy. And if you can't afford therapy, girl, you got to get a second job, a third job. <laughs> You got to find therapists that have a sliding scale. Yeah. So I will say this. When it comes to therapy and resources, it does seem like it's inaccessible. But if you really look hard enough wherever you are in the world and the, in governments and supports, I shouldn't say wherever you are in the world, at least if you're privileged to be in North America, you will find some resources that are accessible, whether it's in group therapy yeah. or it's, you know, these uh, hotlines. That yeah. are there that could provide you that support. Yeah, and also your friends are not your therapists. Oh, facts. They, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. They're not a substitute for therapy. They're not. No, no, no. They'll help you yeah. a little bit, mm -hmm. but you need an objective voice to yeah. give you advice. And someone who's trained and, like you said, who's not biased. Yeah. Um, I always find this. Like, whenever I talk to a friend and I'm like, okay, this person could benefit through using therapy or having a therapist. And they'd be like, no, it's all good. I have friends like you that I can talk to. And I'm like, buddy, <laughs> do not talk to me. Yeah. You know, go to a trained therapist and let it out and let them guide you through the healing process. But also it's like not fair to your friendship. It's like, girl, I'm just trying to have fun today. We're going to the movies. I don't want to hear about, excuse me, whatever sadness. You're, you know what I mean? Like it's because there's like a transfer of energy. If someone's telling you about something traumatic. Mm hmm. It's like, well, I don't want to take that on today. I want to have a good day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, like there's, a, in my opinion, like there's a misunderstanding of what like a good friend is. Like we're there to listen, right? But it yeah. only comes to a certain point. If someone keeps coming to you trauma day after dumping. day, trauma, trauma dumping. I love that word. Yeah. Then it's like, okay, what is the benefit here? Everyone just now is uh, yeah. in this environment where there's a lot of high emotions versus yeah. you go someone objective, they can help you heal. They can guide you. And yeah. uh, and then the second thing you mentioned, and I really appreciated this, is the tribe, finding your tribe. Because yeah. Shout out to RuPaul. Shout out to RuPaul. Yeah. Sh shout out to RuPaul and Mark something. Marco. Marco something, Marco something. yeah. Something. You know okay. RuPaul's famous, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. RuPaul. <laughs> RuPaul is famous. <laughs> this has to be a clip. Can we no, make I this? Yeah. I think RuPaul's famous. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> they are. That's so funny. So... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Finding your tribe very important. Very it important. is, it yeah, is. Because yeah. you can't keep doing things by yourself, right? Yeah. Like, Even, uh, the, how do you think the British colonized 75% of the world? They had their tribe. <laughs> they had their tribe. I mean, they were doing some evil shit with their tribe, <laughs> yeah, but they but, had their tribe. But they had their tribe. Yeah. So you guys, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't colonize, but if you want to succeed. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, find yeah. your tribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, mm -hmm. my question is, you're doing all these amazing things. You're breaking barriers. You're taking these risks. 
How does your family feel about you entering the comedy world? Uh, my mom hates it the most. Okay. Like she truly hates it the most. Um, she just thinks you won't be able to find a husband. What man wants to marry a woman that's on stage talking and doing these things? My mom's very progressive, but then she'll have a switch or she'll she'll say things and I, I don't even recognize her. So there's that. And she's also worried about, I was telling you this earlier, uh, shut off honor. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's something you want to really protect. So she holds those beliefs. And then my dad, he's a bit more progressive. She also doesn't even know what stand-up is, my mom. Whereas so what my, did she think you do then? <laughs> she, for a while, thought it was truly you were being a clown. <laughs> truly, that's what she thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? She doesn't know that you can say there's political commentary. You can say some real things. And then my dad um, understands what stand-up is. He likes Trevor Noah. He likes Chappelle. He likes Rock, Chris Rock. Um, but... You know, he also wants me, he has his own expectations of, I want you to get a PhD. So he gets stand up, but he just, you know, wants me to follow his path. Mm. But that's mm. not me. You know what I mean? But ultimately, what I like about my dad is, I think he has this privilege because he's a man in the culture, in Somali culture, is he's able to actually access, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah. right? So like, self-actualization happiness like women in 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 the culture only get so far they're only allowed to get so far the idea of thinking of happiness and what your goals are and living out your dreams like that generation of women i don't think really had access to that but my dad him being male i think did because he left his he left somalia he went to he got a scholarship to go to university in the states and then came to canada like he got to explore and live a life before he got married and had kids my mom didn't really have that she did the thing that all, a lot of women do which is you live with your family and you get married and you go from one house to mm -hmm. another you know so there's no time in between to really figure out who you are and what you want i like how you're empathetic when it comes to your parents' upbringing and understanding where they're coming from and understanding how they came to be who they are today. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, how does it come to shaping who you are as Hodo? Like, how, does, how do you create those values for yourself? Oh, um, yeah, I just think you have to pick and choose. Like, there's a lot of my, I, I firmly believe that your parents will always know more than you because they've just been alive longer. They've seen some things. They just will know more than you, but they don't know everything and they're not God. You know what I mean? So they don't know everything. So I knew deep down, like, there was no way for me to not do comedy or do writing or any of the things, my creative pursuits, because I knew that would, I would then grow to resent them. Mm -hmm. I just knew that, you know, but everything else I'll like kind of list. What was the question? Look at me going off on a tangent and like. I love it. I love it. So the question was more about how do you create, how did you figure out? Oh, you pick values? and choose your values. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I take tons of things from them. And then I take tons of things from having been born and raised in Canada. Values here that I think are great. There's some values here that aren't so great that I don't need to take on, you know. But there are some values that my parents have that I think are beautiful. What are some values here that you like and some values here you're like, maybe it's not for me, for you as an individual? Um, just like the luxury of being like, what makes me happy? Let me do it. Like people don't even understand the idea of like saying, I want to do a job that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't even get to even entertain that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's really important i think that's something that really is in the air in the atmosphere here in the culture here that i love um yeah something i don't like obviously and we talked about this is uh in the western world like the way older people get treated the elderly is like really weird it's like kind of you know and also you grew, you grew up with this, like this idea of putting your parents in a retirement home and things like that. Like that's the way older people get treated is crazy. But even like, you know, if there's, um, I've seen just in public, like in line at the grocery store or something, if, if it's crowded, like people get mad at an older person instead of just mm -hmm. like helping them or holding the door for them. You see people being nice, but generally speaking, like I went to Somalia for two weeks many years ago with my mom and just like the level of, 
respect that people have for older people, the way they talk to them. It's like they look at them and they, when they see an older person, they're like this, it's like um, they have this, ama- this wealth of knowledge. You know, there's yeah, this African there's... proverb, I forget what, mm-hmm. what, le- what country, but it's like anytime an older person dies, a library burns down. Ooh, I like that. Right? So that's yeah. like kind of like what it is. It's you look at an older person, yeah. you go, they have so much to give. Whereas in this part of the world, I feel like people look at older people and go, mm, they're past their prime, it's done. They're outdated. Yeah. There is definitely more emphasis here on youth and like having a yeah. the young culture. It's interesting. You, you mentioned so many different cool points here. Like I do agree that there is more of a respect in Eastern or different parts of the world when it comes yeah, to... Yeah, overseas. Yeah, yeah. Overseas when it comes to uh, the elderly. When it comes to retirement homes, like it's always been something that has been kind of like the the way to describe like how people are treated here. But like... High Some key, retirement homes are really lit. I would love to be in a retirement home. I think of it as like being in residence. Like personally, and I'm not just saying I will, my parents would never go into a retirement home, but... Oh, they would be so mad at you. They would be so like mad. Like betrayed. Oh Oof, They'd no like, way. we're done with Hanny. Yeah, it's we're like canceling Hanny. It's like this is like, literally would be their biggest fear. I would want to be in a retirement home because... For me, it's like... But who are you with, though, in the retirement home? Because residence is, like, fun people. There are older people that are, like, annoying. Well, you got to pick your uh, your friends. You got to pick your... Your, your yeah. tribe. You got to pick tri- your tribe. <laughs> and then there's some of them got Alzheimer's. It's, like, kind of sad it's towards a, the end. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about, the, about it like that. I just thought it was going to be, like, bingo nights and, like... Doing yeah, salsa. but some of them are going to have some... Sh- some. Am I, are we allowed to swear on the pod? Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, some of them are going to have some crazy shit going on. <laughs> I can see that, but at the same time, I might have some crazy shit, so why not be with people who have crazy shit You know together? what's so funny is there was some study that came out years ago, and they said there in many retirement homes, there were, like, major outbreaks of, like, herpes and all these oh, STDs, because they were just, they don't care. Like, they're nearing the end. They were just I'm not going to no lie, protection. I did not see that one coming. That is uh Yeah, no, 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 it's like, yeah, yeah, they, they don't care anymore, because they're like, oh, we're going to die anyway, and she can't get pregnant. Damn. Girl, this is past. She passed menopause. She's like in another, you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So they're really having a good time in the retirement homes. Yeah, they don't don't care anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so funny. So I get what you're saying of comparing a retirement home to residence. Yeah, I guess it's the same thing. It's kind of the same thing. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, except no birth control. No birth control. Because there's no birth going on. That's the only difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But who knows? Maybe we'll... Maybe in the and future. you really won't, you may not remember the person you hooked up with because you have Parkinson's. Oh, that's very true. Yeah. 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 So, you know, in, in residence, it might just Look be a wild night. haram content that we're <laughs> surfing right now. <laughs> Hashtag this haram is, Hashtag. Oh my God. Haram police are coming at us. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> 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 when it comes to... Um, your parents' expectations. They may have some expectations of you. You mentioned earlier that uh, your dad wanted you to have a PhD. What are some expectations your parents currently have for you? And what are some expectations you have for yourself? Um, Well, I don't want to brag, but I am 31. And uh, my, uh, yeah, I think when you're a woman in your 30s, it's like, okay, well, you need to get married. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You need to have kids. Uh, Right now, those are the big ones that I'm, you know, facing. Uh, But here's the thing. And I want to eventually turn this into a bit, but it's, and I don't know if it'll be funny on stage, but it's a real thought that I've had. I've seen, so growing up, my parents, we weren't poor. We always, I never worried about having a roof over our head and food to eat and clothes. I always never worried about those things. But we were definitely broke. We were, there was a broke immigrant household Mm -hmm. that I, you know, And so I saw what my parents had to do and how hard they had to work. And with inflation and everything that's happening, I'm like, girl, we are not doing broke motherhood. Okay? If I got to wait till I hit a certain tax bracket before I have kids. Because it's like, oh, my God. And I see some of my friends that have kids. And I don't know. They're just worn out and tired, Mm. you know? Um, So I definitely do want to have kids, but it's not now. And like get married and stuff, but I, I want to make sure I have um, what's the word? I don't know, just some money, some you know, some resources, so mm. I can give something to the kid. And also, having been a teacher, 
you know, it's yeah. rough. Like what, what is, I got a little taste of motherhood being a teacher. I don't know what it's like to be a mother full time, but being a teacher, you're, do, you're doing a lot of mothering. And I saw some dark stuff, you know, and it, a kid requires a lot of you. At least I had to say goodbye to them at 3.30. I can see that. I can definitely appreciate the fact that, you know, you want a lifestyle, especially as someone who is so driven like yourself, where you may, you know, want to get a nanny or some extra support. Or but here's have- the thing, growing up, Think of how your grandparents were raised, how my grandparents were raised. What country are your parents from? Palestinian. Palestinian. Yeah. Um, for me, it's Somalia, Djibouti. They all had like, like a woman in the house that would cook and clean. It was never like, that's how my family, you know, there's always someone in the house that's cooking and cleaning. And then the mom is there, but she's not doing everything all the time. Like the, the expression, it takes a village is a very real thing. So even if, let's say, your grandparents didn't have someone in the house to cook and clean, it was like, oh, maybe your grandparents had to go somewhere. They would drop the kids off at the neighbor. Someone would watch the kids. Like, I don't know. It just seemed like it was very communal. It's very true. Now it's like, and now it's me ver- alone. It's individual. Yeah. You're on your own. And that's not a natural way to raise children. I can see that. I can see. That's why I do agree with what you're saying in terms of like going into a different income bracket so you can you are able to afford that, those extra resources because the way in 2022, you know. The village is. The village is no more, right? The village is really, it's more on you yourself, you know, maybe your partner as well to try to figure things out and trying to build careers and establish yourselves and still balance those, those duties. So we talked a lot about expectations. How does someone let go of these expectations? Oh, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but I I do think the stuff I said earlier about um, going to therapy, uh, finding your tribe, and then eventually, um, um, if you live with your parents, you got to move out at some point. You mentioned that uh, earlier on. Yeah, you got to you got to move. You can't live. You can't be 36 and still living with your. Yeah. Like even in the animal kingdom, when you see zebras and polar bears, like they all eventually leave. So you got to move out. I mean, I'm not saying you never see your family again, but (laughs) because they're always going to see you as a kid. Mm -hmm. So for you to be able to get that sense of independence, you need to set those boundaries, move out. I I agree. How old are you? I'm 30. Yeah. So it's like, why would you still live with your mom and dad? I moved out when I was 18 because my parents were in Kuwait and then I had to go to school here. It's been 12 years now. Like they live so close to me and, you know, God bless them. And I'm very grateful for that. But there is no way I'd ever be able to live with them. It's just, it's, you have your own sense of independence, even though they literally live three minutes away from me. So it's And that's the best deal. Isn't it? You can go for dinner, but then go back and just, you know, have your space and your boundaries. That is the dream. Honey. I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. (laughs) Truly. Yeah. (laughs) That's My, great. Yeah, no, I'm very grateful for that. But I do agree that a lot of times, especially uh, in ethnic communities, as, as which is great. Like we do live with our parents, you know, as we get older. And sometimes it works for people. And, you know, we I have a lot of friends who are still living with their parents. And the way it works is you only move out when you get married. But other times it might not necessarily be the formula for you. That's true. I like right. that. Yeah. Are my glasses dirty? I love that I'm asking this question at like minute 45. A bit of 45. Is your glasses dirty? Okay, because they, they feel... They yeah, feel dirty. Know, yeah, yeah, they feel dirty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this this is right. content. <laughs> this Hashtag is... content queen. Hashtag content queen. I yeah, love it. Yeah. That's going to be the TikTok right yeah, there. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, no, awesome. So I want to know if someone cannot move out for x amount of reasons could be financial reasons could be because you know their family really does not want them to move out and they may lose their family if they move out what advice could you tell that person oh you got to make a plan to move out you got to make a plan or and you just have you it's a must that you go to therapy and don't do therapy like zoom therapy in the house go to like a library if Mm. you have to like two weeks ago i I had to do therapy because right now i'm staying with my family and you know i go back and forth but um 
I, I don't do Zoom therapy in the house. I'll go to like literally the public library. And it was during the day. I remember it was like, like 1 p.m. or something. And they ran out of like study rooms. Private study rooms were all booked up. So I had to do Zoom therapy with my headphones in in the children's section of the library. So I'm just like. That's dedication. Yo. So I'm just talking about trauma and sad things. But the kids are just playing. They don't care. Mm -mm. I think maybe because I was a teacher for so long that I'm like, oh, kids actually don't care. So it's fine. But yeah, don't do Zoom therapy in your house. Also, it's just, um, I don't know, just every day go for a walk or spend a couple hours outside of the house. Okay. Just breathe. I like both those answers because one, I do think it just goes back to the, the overall theme right now is really need to go to therapy. I think if you are creative, if you want to yeah. achieve beyond yeah. what you're already achieving and you feel like there's certain things that you need to work on you need to be mentally yeah good here i also think really you have to sit down and have just like when your parents are in a good mood sit down with your parents and just talk to them mm. as people and don't get angry um yeah i realized when you like show any kind of irritation or get annoyed or even raise your voice you lose like they're not going to listen to you anymore Okay, so guidebook to talking to ethnic parents. Do not raise your voice. Yeah, don't show any kind of irritation. Do not Poker show. face the whole time. Okay, be very calm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So what else? What else can we include? In um, this? They'll do a bunch of gaslighty things. You know, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. love that. They we love to make you feel like here. you're crazy. Oh, right? absolutely. Or you're yeah. wrong, right? So you just, you just, you just uh, be compassionate and try to see it from their point of view. But then still, still stay strong with what you're saying. Like, still go mm -hmm. back to, I want to have a good relationship with you guys. I love you. Also, finding your parents' trigger words. So I realized if I say you guys to my parents, they don't like that. It's too informal for them. Mm -hmm. And they get mad. Yeah. Okay, interesting. That, I like that. Because I do agree that every parent and every single person has a trigger word. So yeah. yours is you, you guys. My parents hate you guys. My mom hates when I um, am shocked and I do this with my eyes. I go, you know, and I like, and I really make my eyes big. <laughs> it truly hurts her feelings. Like, I don't fully understand it, but I just really try to like be mindful of how big my eyes are when I'm talking when to you're her. When you're talking, yeah. okay. It's yeah. <laughs> like so you want to uh, raise yeah. your eyes when you're like trying to squint. Because I think she thinks it's that? like condescending. Like I'm really looking at her like, you're crazy, you know? What? Like, I think that's how she sees it. I don't fully it's get it, but find your parent. And also, you have to understand there's yeah. like a second language. Like, they're ESL. Mm. So there's just certain things you'll say in English that just won't... They won't understand. They won't fully. understand, yeah. It's interesting. Like, so for my mom, I discovered that the word boundaries mm. is her trigger word. When I say I'm setting boundaries or trying to create healthy boundaries. But I realize it's because the way she interprets boundaries is not what we would define as boundaries. It's like, I am cutting them off. And I'm like, no, that is not what I, yeah. what a boundary is. So what word do you use instead of boundaries? I say, I'm like, I need some, I need some time just to like do some work or some space. Oh, that's so, great. See, right? like, there you go. You got to just switch up the language. Switch up the language. And then that's, you know, that's setting up boundaries, but it's like, do not use the word boundaries. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, but that's the thing. So I like this. This is the guide of how to talk to, to ethnic, ethnic parents. parents. Yeah. We talked about uh, the guide for ethnic parents on how to talk to them. Don't wear a Marilyn Monroe shirt when Don't you're talking wear to your oh my God. ethnic parents. Definitely would not be wearing haram, this shirt. Haram. Haram vibes. Yo, my mom was like, why do you have a woman on your shirt? <laughs> I was like, and what did you say to her? I was like, it's Marilyn Monroe. And she's like, yeah, lahui. Which is like, oh my God, like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, and what did you say? How did you describe Marilyn Monroe to your <laughs> Arab mother? I think she thinks Marilyn Monroe is Madonna. So she's very confused well, by Well, you know, so she did, was inspired by her. Yeah, yeah, yeah so maybe. But So she thinks it's Madonna. She she's Madonna. Madonna. Yeah. And then what was her reaction to that? She's just like, why? And, she, what, and I'm like, I don't know. I like it. It's kind of, I like it, you know? And she's like, but why? <laughs> I got one last question for you. Mm -hmm. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, um, yeah, I remember you. Uh, best piece of advice. Oh, my therapist said this, and she said, we can do therapy all day. But if you don't learn 
to question your thoughts and create a separation and understand that you are not your thoughts, there will be no progress. So whenever you have a thought like, oh, I'm a horrible person, why did I do that, I'm an idiot, da da da, if the, you don't under, like create a separation and observe your thoughts, mm. you're screwed. I love that. Do you know what I mean? That's like You can't premise. identify with your thoughts. Sometimes yeah. it's literally like, it's just a product of your environment, it's just random. There's no rhyme or reason to why sometimes people have a thought. So yeah, I realized like, you know, I had to really observe my actual thoughts. So that has been so life-changing. And question what you're thinking. I love that. It's yeah. mindfulness 101, right? You're separate. You're separate from your thoughts. You, yeah, yeah. Because they're, they're, yeah, I, I think that's so, so important. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a really good piece of advice. Everyone, take notes. Are you guys taking notes? Taking notepad. Notes? Where's the notepad? Where's, Where's your notepad? <laughs> huh? With your Tims? Okay, yeah. now on the flip side. Yeah. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Um, someone told me like early, very early in my career, like this was like a month or a few months into my career. And keep in mind, I've been doing stand up for 11 years. So this very early in my career, mm -hmm. I remember so a Muslim person told me, you should wear an abaya on stage. Are you nuts? That's not, not even a part of the way I reg regularly dress. But it, his point of view was you're a representative for the religion. So you got to look the part. And it's like, but that's not who I am. So I just, I didn't have the language to say all of that. But now I look back and I go, what horrible advice. What an idiot. You know what I mean? We're an abaya on We're stage. Abaya. Because it represents the religion? Is that what's Well, it's the like logic? you want to look super pious and like, you know, look, girl, that ain't it. Oh, so he was doing it more from like a branding. Yeah, tactic. I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah, that's not who I am. Like, you know, okay, I yeah. only wear them to the mosque. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I thought that was really stupid advice. Also, mm. um, sometimes comedians will say, um, this never do this in comedy. If someone has an idea for a joke or has already done it or you've seen a tweet about it, don't ever try to do another version of that. Like you don't want to like copy someone's stuff. So I've had comedians say like, oh, you can, why not just take that? And those are sh shitty comedians to stay away from. Damn. So you yeah. got to be your own, got to create something. You got to be, be inspired. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can Like be artists, music, musicians get to do a remix to a song. There's no remix to a joke. People mm. want you to come uh, come up with your own original material. Damn, I love that. Yeah. We, we can have another whole podcast episode about the thought process yeah. of comedians and how you guys come up with jokes. Well, inshallah, the next time I'm on here, I make yeah. you cry again. Yeah, we started off with yeah. lots of laughter. It's you definitely... have that, right? The footage of him crying. <laughs> if that's not, if you don't send me that clip, I'm going to be so mad. I'll cry. I'll cry then if you don't send cry. me that clip. Yeah. <laughs> That is so funny it. of us that, just laughing so hard. That's great. That was two jokes. Okay. I want to thank you and wrap this up. Uh, you've been you're so, very, so... You're very like with the hands. I know. People it's call like me you're like... you kind of like a ma magician I'm a something. magician. People can say I'm Drake because, you know, Drake got that hands gesture thing. I like to you say... Rappers yeah. always do that. They yeah, always do, you know? Yeah, yeah that's you know? true. Rapper down there. Not down there. Like in my heart. <laughs> Haram. <laughs> Haram, we love it. We love it. I'm wearing the Maryland shirt, saying he's a rapper. Let's send this clip to his mother and say the word boundaries, label this video boundaries, and really upset her. <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> Hold on. You've been incredible. What was like the name you called me earlier? <laughs> Horror show? I, I, so. I, 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 I think when that clip comes out, I'm gonna change my name on Instagram and in brackets I'll put like I'll type it out. I swear to you, I'm gonna do that. I'm dying. Yeah. Oh my god, I do apologize. I'll say hold that. the hit to aka horse show. Yeah, I'll do that. Girl, I'm gonna do that. Horror show. Oh my god. Yes, that's gonna be the new name. You know, it could be <laughs> you could try that name out. Oh my god, I can't even speak anymore. I love that. But, yes, yes. Hold on. Buddha comedy, 
You've been absolutely incredible. I thank can't thank you. you know, I'm already crying again. I this is off so crying beautiful. And crying. Yeah, you're ending and crying. Yeah. And it's spelled H O O D O comedy. I just got to say that because people with the O's, they get it wrong because there's three O's. Sometimes people go H O D O. Sometimes people go H O D O O. And Roy Wood Jr. has mm. this great bit of advice. This could help your followers. You want to buy the misspellings when you're doing a website. Mm. so like That's for yella point, yeah. some someone's gonna add an extra a at the end mm. you know so like for me i bought all the misspellings of my you name bought all the misspellings h-o-d-o comedy h-o-o-o-o-d-o comedy so it's like whatever they type in it'll go to my website love it yeah so i'm gonna leave this one last message for you to say to oh, the camera where say whatever you'd like tell people where they can find you uh hi my name is hold the hersey the vanilla version of my name is hodo hersey you're welcome. And um, I had fun on the podcast. Feel free to follow me on all social media platforms at Holdo Comedy. So that's H-O-O-D-O -O -O Comedy on all the things that are distracting us from the real world. TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, all the fun things. Um, you're great. And, um, you know, the ice caps are melting. Have a great night. Amazing. Thank you so much. You guys, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, YouTube, wherever you are finding us. Hashtag yellow bye. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Yellow Let's Talk, where we are going to help you figure things out by people who are still trying to figure things out. And I'm already laughing. So today we got with us Horso. <laughs> Today we got with us, hold on, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> okay, so, so today we got with us. <laughs> oh man, I feel like this is, <laughs> you know, you have like a class presentation and then you just start laughing. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. So today we got with us none other than Hodo Hersey. Hodo made her late night television debut on Seth Meyers. She performed with and at Hassan Minaj. I was doing so good. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>